So back to our spider diagram. We've now covered everything on the top. Uh, sort of. I didn't directly talk about the acetylides, but ultimately what's happening there? You have a carbon nucleophile. What can the carbon nucleophile do? Attack the electrophilic carbon of a polar pi bond. Okay. The bottom half is where it gets all tricky. So another potentially embarrassing question. How many of you have not watched any part of the kinetic and thermodynamic video? You should really watch those parts. Okay. I would really greatly appreciate that. Okay. It will help when we're moving into this next sequence. And what we're doing is modifying our starting material. Instead of it being just a straight polar pi bond, I'm now conjugating it with an alkene. And what I end up with is a structure known as an alpha beta unsaturated, in this case, carbonyl. That changes the reactivity or provides more reactivity than just a standard carbonyl. Not only do I have an alkene that can potentially react like an alkene, but I also now have two electrophilic sites. The carbon of my carbonyl is partially positive because it's attached to that electronegative oxygen, withdrawing electron density. Well, to stabilize that partial positive, the alkene can do resonance and share electrons across. By doing that sharing, what happens to that last carbon? It also becomes partially positive. Okay. We now have two electrophilic sites. Which one is the correct electrophilic site is now going to depend on this concept of kinetic versus thermodynamic which is not a clean line, unfortunately, because it's all going to be based on the nucleophile. And why do I mean it's not a clean line? Well, chapter 17, if it attacks the carbonyl carbon, we have the strongest nucleophiles. Okay. What would be a strong nucleophile? Hydride. More specifically, or less specifically, a negative charge. Awesome. If we move to the right-hand side, with these strong nucleophiles, where did our nucleophile attack? The beta position of our alkene. Okay. What identifies a strong nucleophile? A negative charge. Either way, we have a nucleophile with a negative charge, but it attacks different positions. Okay. To decide which position it's attacking, it's ultimately coming down to knowing something about the reactivity of that negative charge. How reactive is it? If it's incredibly reactive, it's going to neutralize as fast as possible. Okay. To react as fast as possible, it's going to find the most positive atom, which will be the carbon of our carbonyl. Why is that carbon more positive? Carbon to oxygen as opposed to carbon to carbon. If it is not that horribly negative, okay, and again, it's still negative, it then has enough time to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to attack the other position. And the reason that comes out of this is that our product on the right is more stable than the product on the left. Meaning the product on the right is the thermodynamic product, the product on the left is the kinetic product. That may not be inherently obvious looking at these structures, but one thing that kind of clicked through my head that all of a sudden I went, oh, that matches. We've seen this kind of thing happening before. We have a ketone on one side, and on the other side I have an alkene, and an alcohol. Do not get me wrong. I am not calling this an enol. It is not an enol. But it does have an alkene and an alcohol. When we looked at the enol and the ketone, which was favored? Ketone. The ketone. Why? It is thermodynamically more favored. 
The structure that gives us the carbonyl is thermodynamically more favored than the structure that gives us the alkene and the alcohol. Okay. This is where that kinetic and thermodynamic lecture comes into play because we look at the keto enol tautomerization and say which is kinetic, which is thermodynamic, and why. It's all coming back. Okay. So, what this diagram from your book shows is ultimately, again, that separation in charge. We have two electrophilic sites. The nucleophile has a choice to attack either one. Okay. So this is where we'll bust into our kinetics versus thermodynamics and look at our overall reaction and try and decide which one is which. Okay. So we could draw out a nice little energy diagram and look at our reactants, our intermediates, and our products to try and predict what happens. Okay. This was nicely labeled all the way through, except that my color coding was horrible in this because red has always been color coded as the thermodynamic product. So I miscolor coded this, so I'm going to draw over the top of these. Okay, and we'll look at why it's the thermodynamic product. So let's take a look first at our intermediate. When we look at our intermediates, which would we say is more stable, the top one or the bottom one? Why would you say the top one's more stable? Oh, interesting. We'd say oxygen holds the charge better than carbon. Those of you paying really careful attention should be saying, Mike, you're doing the wrong comparison. Why am I doing the wrong comparison? That bottom one has a resonance structure. And as soon as we see resonance, we should say, aha, which one's more stable? The bottom one, because it has resonance. But what's our reasoning on why? Okay, we could look at resonance, or we could just say, oh, where's our charge? We've got a negative charge on our oxygen versus a negative charge on our oxygen. There is no difference according to our atom effects which means we move through our stability, charge is the same, atom uh, size is the same, atom electronegativity is the same, molecule resonance. The bottom one has resonance, the top one does not, which means our bottom one has the lower energy intermediate. So we've got intermediate uh, let's not label it there. Let's label it down here. Intermediate 1. That says intermediate. And we have, I'm just going to say, I2 for intermediate 2. Okay. Well, what happens when we now move to our product? And you can argue with me about the product in a little bit if you would like. What do you see as the most reactive thing in both those structures? Alkene. Alkene. Why do you not say the alcohol? And I agree with you. The alkene is correct. Why? Good call on that. I agree with that, too. The pi bond is higher in energy than our alcohol. There's another more important reason. What's the difference between the alcohol? Nothing. Nothing. They're the same. Okay. So we could look to the alcohol, but we'll quickly see that it's identical. There's no reason to evaluate the alcohol. Where my difference is, is in the alkene. Okay. Classify the top alkene for me. Say that again. Not primary, so I'm going to want to change your words, but you got the right idea. Terminal is technically true. Uh, least substituted is also true. I was going for one substitution, prime, or single mono substituted. There's our word. Is that what you guys are shouting over here? 
Yeah. We've got mono substituted in the top one. In the bottom one, we have tri substituted. Which one produces the more stable double bond? The tri substituted, which means our bottom one is more stable. So product number one is more stable than product number two, which means when we go back and look at our diagram, there we go. This starts to look a little bit weird. Those of you that saw the kinetic and thermodynamic lecture, when we looked at, say, the addition of HBr to an alkene, what happened? Our intermediate energies were interchanged in comparison to our product energies. We don't have that situation here. If we connected this out, just as we would potentially normally predict, and this, you don't have to remember this, but our, according to the Hammond postulate, our activation energy is closer uh, to the reactant or product that is closer in energy to it. So the reactant is the closest in energy. I would expect to have the exact same energy curve for those, and those would be slightly different, which then means which one happens faster? The red one. They both have identical activation energies as our diagram shows. Only when we get down to our second step does our activation energy for the red one appear to be smaller than for our blue one. Which means when we run this reaction, what product should we expect? Product number one, our red one, every single time our nucleophile should attack only the alkene. This is not what we see. So something about our diagram is wrong. Everything we've drawn on up to this point has been the energy of individual species. And then I went through and drew over the top something about our activation barrier. And we just said according to our Hammond postulate rules, which again you don't have to remember because it's not actually true in this case, that our activation energy is the same for both of those. But is the activation energy the same for both of those? Look at the transition state of the nucleophile attacking the carbonyl carbon versus our beta carbon. In the case of our nucleophile, it's always a negative attacking our carbonyl carbon being a really big positive. In the case of the other one, damn color coding, much less positive. Which interaction is going to be stronger? The first one, which does what to that energy? Drops it. So what ends up happening for our blue pathway is that the activation energy for that first step is lower than the activation energy for our red product. What we're seeing in our difference between kinetic versus thermodynamic comes down to the transition state, not a specific intermediate. Where have we seen the transition state determining kinetics versus thermodynamics? The Diels-Alder reaction. It's identical to the setup in our Diels-Alder reaction. So when we now go through and look at this, we can draw on the rest of our curves. Whoa, wrong color. Which reaction should produce our product fastest? The blue one with the smallest, smallest activation energy in that first step. So if it occurs the fastest, product two will be our kinetic product, and product one, being lower in energy, will be the thermodynamic product. I can't spell. I'm going to stop there while I'm at it. Okay. How do we use this information then to predict the type of addition we get? Okay. So let's pause real quickly for a moment because I forgot to address one more thing. In our kinetic versus thermodynamic, what we are referencing is the nucleophile attacking our alkene versus our carbonyl. 
And the name for those reactions, instead of calling them kinetic and thermodynamic or even alkene and carbonyl, is we reference them as either a 1-2 or a 1-4 addition. What does that mean? What changed in this top reaction versus the bottom reaction? So yes, the alkene changed location, but as we said with alkenes, those are ultimately just resonance structures. So I don't accept telling me the location of the alkene. The location of the nucleophile is different. Is that the only thing that's different? Or what attached? Or the hydrogen. What changed in the course of the reaction? Hydrogen and a nucleophile were added to the structure. So 1, 2, or 1, 4 addition. Because what did I do? An addition reaction. Why do I reference it as the 1, 2, or the 1, 4? If we say the hydrogen was, positioned, was bound to the oxygen at position 1, where's the nucleophile attached? That product would then be the 1, 2 addition. We look at the other one. We say the oxygen where the hydrogen was attached was position 1. Where's the nucleophile attached? It's the 1, 4. Yes, I put the hyphen in the wrong space. Give me a second. Addition. That's where the 1, 2, 1, 4 addition comes from. One last curveball. When we look at the 1, 2 addition, this is the product shown. When you look at the 1, 4 addition, that is not the product shown. What do I mean? Let's go back one slide. The 1, 2 addition, hydrogen nucleophile. There's our 1, 2. Which means the other one must be the 1, 4 addition. When we look at the 1, 4 addition, oh, my nucleophile was the R. So there's my nucleophile. Where did the hydrogen add? Interesting. When we look at the actual product shown, it looks like it's a 1, 2, and a 1, 2 addition. Why do we not call the attack on our far right a 1, 2 addition? It's always referenced as the 1, 4. This is our 1, 4 addition. But we did not add the nucleophile and the hydrogen to the 1 and 2 position, or 1 and 4 position. We added them to the 1 and 2 position. What's the difference between the product I have shown here and the product we have shown on that slide? What's that? This structure is an enol which very rapidly tautomerizes into your carbonyl drawn rather quickly and sopily that was shown on the other page. Okay. Why did I break it down and leave it at the enol as our apparent product? I ran out of space, number one. <laughs> and number two, it's nice to show reference that this is why it's the one four. The 1, 4 is referencing what we would expect as our product before it does secondary chemistry. Okay. Questions on that? Yes. It does not. It, well, it could potentially go back to the enol, but you usually have to activate it. It will be in small concentrations going back to the enol. Uh, 
So if we just draw on the first step real quickly here. The next part of this is going to become important is that if we are now looking at our reaction, one of the things we could do is try and control which product we get through temperature. Okay. And that if we heat it up, what happens? If I go to very high temperatures, what happens? What's the first product formed? Kinetic. What if it's at low temperatures? What's the first product formed? Kinetic. What if it's at stupidly high, ridiculously, stupidly awesome temperatures? Which is the first product form? Kinetic. Because? Kinetic always forms faster. Period. Okay. If we are at high temperatures, what now happens? I form my kinetic product, but I have now given it enough energy that what it can, what, bleh, what can it do? It can run the reverse reaction. Which means I end up with a small population of my reactant still left over. And as long as I have enough temperature to achieve that next activation barrier, what happens? My reactant can move to being my thermodynamic product. According to Le Chatelier, when then, once I'm at the thermodynamic product, what happens to the reversibility? It's now thermodynamically so low in energy that can I do the reverse reaction? Nope. So that material has now been removed effectively from the reaction. Okay. So now I have no concentration of reactant. And according to Le Chatelier's principle, what then happens? Our equilibrium shifts to affect a change in our equilibrium. So our intermediate that had formed fastest our kinetic product, then goes back some more to reform the reactant. And now we're back at equilibrium. But now that reactant has the opportunity to form the thermodynamic product. And once I'm at the thermodynamic product, can I do the reverse? No, no because that activation barrier for the reverse reaction is now too high. And I can't do the reverse. So every single time we run a reaction, the kinetic product always forms first. If we provide the reaction enough energy, we now do the reverse reaction of our kinetic, and we can clear into our thermodynamic product. Okay, so if we run our reaction in an incredibly short amount of time, we'd expect the kinetic. If we give it enough time to achieve its normal equilibrium state, the product we get is our thermodynamic. And that's all driven by everybody's favorite French scientist, Le Chatelier. He's French, isn't he? No. I mean, he sounds French. Okay. So how can we predict whether that reaction was particularly reversible or not? Because what we said was it all depended on the nucleophile, which one attacked. Okay. Well, I wish there was a way that we could predict which side of our reaction was favored. So if I take HCl and I add it to water, I can run an acid-base reaction and I get H3O plus and Cl minus. Everybody okay with that? Cool. What happens? Do I actually get H3O plus and Cl minus or does it stay as water and HCl? What's that? It dissociates. Why does it dissociate? It's a strong acid. Awesome. You memorized a good rule. Why is it a strong acid? Why is it a weak base? Okay. It comes back to the stability of the ions formed versus leaving them neutral. And we have a way to quantify that using pKa's. So if I take a look at this reaction, say HCl and water, I'm, ooh, I don't know which one's the acid. I can look at the pKa's. The pKa that is the smallest is the strongest acid, which means if I just have HCl and H2O, I say, oh, HCl acts as the acid, which means it needs to get rid of the hydrogen, and it needs to give it to H2O. H2O then becomes H3O plus, and I'd have leftover Cl minus. So now I've predicted based off of the pKa. The lower the pKa, that one was the acid. How can I then use that information to also predict 
the magnitude of the direction of the reaction. Well, what happens to reverse the reaction? What does H3O plus have to act as? It has to act as an acid. This one's easier. We don't even have to evaluate pKa's because can CO minus possibly act as an acid? No, no because it doesn't have any hydrogen. So I can now do the reverse, and I can now compare the pKa's of the acid across the equation. For those of you that took organic with me first semester, we talked about this in which lab? The no. No. My heart's breaking. <laughs> those of you that didn't take me for first semester, you talked about it in which lab? Extraction. The whole reason the extraction process works is by predicting through your pKa's. Right. So what do we do to predict? Well, we look at the acid on each side of the equation. And we say, okay, I'm now forced to stick my hand in one of those acids. Which one do I stick my hand in? I stick it in the H3O+. Why? It's not as strong an acid. Chemistry is doing the same thing. We push for neutrality. We push for the weakest acids. We push for the weakest bases. We can use that pK inf pKa information to predict the direction of our reaction. So with that, we would say more than likely it would favor our reactants, or sorry, our products, and not so much our reactants. And we could show an equilibrium arrow. We can push this even further. What is the magnitude difference between those two. Five point something on a log scale, which means it's like 5,000 units of difference, which means no reactant forms. This reaction pushes uniformly, completely towards the product. What we told you to memorize in GenChem were the strong acids. Why? Because of this, we added it to water. We looked at the pKa's and said, this is what happened. Memorize these so that that way you don't have to memorize all the weak ones. Can we then use this information in the case of our reaction? Where's the acid in the first step? You should have a really hard time with that one. We have a Lewis acid on our carbon, but our pKa's were based off of Bronsted-Lowry acids. Do we have a Bronsted-Lowry acid? No. So we can't use pKa's. But we can use something else. If we go back up to that reaction, what we can do instead is look at the base strength. Which side of the reaction is going to be favored? The one with the stronger base or the one with the weaker base? Weaker. The weaker base. Exact same rules apply. What's the issue we encounter with that? You'd have to know the PKBs. Okay? Nobody memorizes the PKBs, and you can calculate them, but even I'm lazy enough where I didn't go through and calculate them on our next slides. So what we need to be thinking about is what would happen in this. Okay? What would the PKB be? So if we're now comparing across, what we would then look at is the size of those pKbs. What would we expect the pKb of our chloride to be? Zero. Very, very high in comparison to our water. Okay. What's the pKa of water? Relatively low. What would the pKa... Uh, we can't run into that. Dang it. So what we're going to end up doing is evaluating the base strength. The side of the reaction that has the weaker base will be our favored reaction. So now let's put it all together. Your textbook has a nice picture. If we use hydride as a nucleophile, okay, so its pKa is really, 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 really big. Okay, it's so big uh, that it doesn't act as an acid, right? Because do we have H plus? No, it's by definition H minus. So it is a massive pKa. Okay. What does that mean about its pKb? 
incredibly small, which means what about the basicity of H minus? It's an incredibly strong base. Through our first intermediate, what base do we have? What is our basic or even nucleophilic atom, if you will, in our first intermediate step? O negative. The pKa of O negative is something like 16, so relatively small, which means the pKb will be relatively big. Which is the weaker base? The oxygen. By how much? We said this was incredibly small because the pKa is big. This one's pKb will be relatively big. If we have a large difference between those, what happens to the reversibility if I use hydride? Completely irreversible. If I now add that information to my curve, what happens? Which product forms first, the blue one or the red one? Blue one, lowest activation barrier. So we run through our reaction. The hydride first attacks the carbonyl. We form some of that product. Can I reverse that reaction? No. This came down to looking at the strength of our nucleophiles, the strength of the base. Hydride is a stupidly strong base. Hydroxide, not as strong. What does that mean? We favor the side of the reaction that produces the weaker base. Stupidly strong versus just strong. How big of a difference do we have there? Stupidly big, which means non-reversible. If I cannot reverse the reaction at this point, can I form the thermodynamic product? No. How could I change my energy diagram so that I can further accent the fact that this is now uh, an incredibly irreversible reaction? The thermodynamic one will still always be lower in energy. But when I further accent the fact of the difference of our nucleophile, we can now see it is going to be very difficult to reverse this reaction, which then means I only get the kinetic product. What happens if I move to a carbon nucleophile? This one is actually moving into our scale of pKa's. Hydride's pKa is so incredibly large that it doesn't even get reported. The pKa for an alkane, we do report, is 50, which means its pKb is small, but not stupidly small. The pKb for O minus, small, but not really small. What happens? There's now a large difference in the base strength between those two species, which means the reaction becomes irreversible. So when I use a carbon nucleophile, the reaction does not reverse, and I get the kinetic product. What happens? Let's see what the next one is. Uh, sure. Let's move to the cyanide nucleophile. The negative charge is held on which atom? The carbon. Okay. It's kind of tricky in our formula there, but it's held on the carbon. So we might immediately go, well, carbon nucleophiles were irreversible, which means I should get the kinetic product. For cyanide, what do we end up seeing? It actually forms the thermodynamic product. So we can't just say carbon nucleophiles always give us kinetic. Why? Look at the pKa. Your pKa starts to get close to the level of our oxygen which means what? It starts to become reversible. The more reversible it becomes, the more likely we get the thermodynamic product. How do we know that difference? Well, kind of obnoxious, because I'm telling you, you'd have to look at the PKBs for all of these. 
Right? Well, how do we figure out the PKBs? We tested it in the lab and we found an answer that always worked. So we're, I'm telling you that you should know that the hydride and the Grignard reagent form your kinetic product because they form the kinetic product. That's a bit disingenuous. I apologize, but it's all we got. Okay. And it's going back to looking at the stabilities of those starting materials, the most active species on each side of the equation. What happens if we had instead switched to an oxygen nucleophile? The pKa's are now identical, which means it's reversible. What happens if I have an oxygen nucleophile? I get the thermodynamic product. Your textbook has provided a table that shows you nucleophiles that add reversibly and nucleophiles that add irreversibly. On the irreversible, the very first one, what's the nucleophile? Carbon. Next one. Next one. Next one. Hydride. Next one. Hydride. So all of the nucleophiles that should never ever exist because they're so incredibly reactive are irreversible. When we look at the reversible ones, oxygen, nitrogen, our halides, oxygen, our cyanide. We got a carbon nucleophile again. Why? It comes back to the relationship between your values. Okay. Last one, another carbon nucleophile. Crap, how do we know that carbon nucleophile adds reversibly? Again, look at its pKa. Its pKa is almost identical to that of just a water molecule. Easiest way to figure this out so that you don't screw it up? Really sorry, memorize. Okay. What I would do is memorize the ones that add irreversibly. Grignards, Yervitig, hydrides. The rest I'd be like, eh, let's just say it adds reversibly, it should give me the other product. So the reversible ones give me which product? The thermodynamic product. But when you look at the product, how do you know it's thermodynamic? And it becomes a little bit trickier to figure out. So instead of referring to it as a thermodynamic, we can refer to it as the 1,4 addition. The other ones are your kinetic products, and those are your 1,2 addition. Okay. Ready for the last curveball on this? There is another carbon nucleophile. Ah, uh, never mind. Let's do this first. So take a look at these. Okay. Which product do you expect? Okay. So the cheat that I'm throwing out here is first identify your kinetic versus thermodynamic. So our cheat is keto or enol. Okay. I would call this first one, sorry, I should draw it. This is my keto and this is my enol. Which one was more stable? Keto, which means the keto is my thermo product. Once I know that, now it's a question of reversibility. Is the reaction reversible? Yes, then it means thermodynamic. No, then it means kinetic, the other one. So take a minute, see what you guys can come up with with labeling these. So both thermodynamic and kinetic, uh, I just lost connection. Um, hopefully that came back. Thermodynamic and kinetic all the way through for which one's which. And then identify the major product. Which product should you actually draw as your official answer for that particular reaction? Have you okay. So our first cheat method keto or enol form. Our ketos are thermodynamic. So in the first one, red circled is thermodynamic. The blue one is our kinetic. In the next one, keto versus our enol. Our red one is our thermodynamic. Blue one is our kinetic. Look at that. I got tricky on that last one. That was totally unintentional, but I'm glad I did that. Okay. Our keto is the one on the right, circled with red, uh, our, uh, which makes it our thermodynamic. And our enol is our kinetic. 
the next step in this is deciding reversible or irreversible with our nucleophile. Okay. The first one is a carbon Grignard nucleophile, which means irreversible. The next one, it is reversible. Last one, irreversible. What does that mean? Irreversible means kinetic is my major product. Reversible means my thermodynamic is my major product. Irreversible, sorry, kinetic. Okay. Questions? The kinetic products are not enols. Okay. They are alkenes and alcohols, but they are not the enol. The enol means that the alcohol is directly attached to the carbon of the alkene. They just appear like them. Okay. So really, and that is an important distinction to make. I'm not calling this the keto and enol form. What I'm saying is one form is definitely a ketone, and the other one is our air quotes enol it has that kind of kinetic versus thermodynamic relationship. An an there is an alkene and an alcohol present in it. It's just not an enol. So it's an e-dash-all. Any way we want to do it, yeah. Okay. Questions on that? Yes? On questions, would there ever be like a double-sided arrow? Kind of um... In slides, I tend to throw that at you. On quizzes, I throw that at you. On an exam, no. On the exam, very rarely do we actually use the not full length or full equivalent equilibrium arrows. Um, we almost always show them either as fully equilibrium or one direction. Okay. And even if it's shown one direction, one of your answers can still be no reaction. So don't read too much into reading those on exam questions. If I write it, there's a possibility that that's true, but it's kind of a crapshoot. Your final exam, no. I wouldn't trust it. it Save my life. Okay? So our irreversible ones tend to be our carbon nucleophiles. Okay? And that's what I would jump all over. I see a negative carbon, irreversible. There are some massive exceptions to that. We looked at a couple of those. The enols um, are enolate ions. The cyanide, okay, both of those are reversible. Okay. But hey, at least when I have a carbon bound to a metal, directly bound to a metal, it's irreversible. Which product do we get? You memory. Okay. We have a, an organic compound, a carbon bound to a metal, copper. And so we would say, bound to a metal, I should get the kinetic product. It's just like a Grignard reaction. It's not. Okay. This particular reagent produces the thermodynamic product as your major product. We've got a product that's going against everything that we would claim to be valid, which means if everything's going completely haywire and weird, of course we name it for the person that discovered this weirdness. These are typically referred to as Gilman reagents. Okay. So if you see an organo copper lithium compound, it is very typically a Gilman reagent, and where it will add is in the thermodynamic position, it'll add to the beta position of your alpha, beta, unsaturated carbonyls. Okay. Why is this the case? Uh, well, what's the difference between your Grignard reagent and your Gilman reagent? So let's just pick something really simple here. Let's just say CH2, CH3 to our copper. To magnesium. 
So our top one is our Gilman, and our bottom one is our Grignard. What's the difference? Copper versus magnesium. What's the difference between copper and magnesium, princess? The electronegativity. Copper is much more electronegative than magnesium. It starts to equate to the electronegativity of carbon, which means the negative charge that builds on the carbon, much less so. That's why we have a reversible reaction. The carbon becomes less nucleophilic. Okay. The only way you would know that is doing the experiment or having all of the electronegativities directly in front of you to predict something about that. And even then, you're just kind of saying, well, it's lower in electro or higher in electronegativity, so maybe it would attack the four position. Okay. So all I can really tell you is you just have to know it. If you see that uh, organo technically we call them the lithium organocuprates. Um, you're looking at a Gilman reagent thermodynamic product. Okay. Questions on that? Um, is it possible to reassure Sure. because I'm just going to draw your mechanism of dancing over the top. Nucleophile attacks, breaks your pi bond, you form a negative charge on your carbon. That structure is resonance stabilized. I decided to not draw the resonance in this case. That negative charge in the next step of the reaction when we add a source of acid is protonated. We get our final structure. You'll notice that this overall mechanism is very darn similar to every other mechanism we've shown for this type of reagent because the mechanism is the same. It's the hand. Um, what happened to like the second CH3CH2? Did that not break off? What second CH3CH2? Like in the reagent CH3CH2? Oh, I see what you're saying in there. Yeah. So you get two of them. That reagent has two active nucleophiles. So the other half of this molecule this can now potentially go out and attack another one. Oh, so you just kind of yep. Oh. Is the mechanism vastly more complicated than this? Yes, because the copper does all sorts of other weird stuff with it the mechanism that you're responsible for, negative carbon attacks the beta position of your alpha beta unsaturated ketone. That's what you're responsible for. Okay. Other questions? Ding. Uh, we'll come back to that. And that. So we'll start, just so you know, we still have time, so don't pack up quite yet. Um, we'll start Monday with these two syntheses. Work on them. Okay. Already in this first one, I just want you to make the alkene. We said alkene, which immediately should send off alarm bells saying, do the bidding. Next one down. You guys have seen this one in your practice exams already. You officially didn't know how to do it. Now you know how to do it for sure. So go through and do that one as well. Okay. Um, it may take a couple extra steps based on the reagents that you know. We'll keep coming back to this one because we'll keep shortening that synthesis down because you can do it in shorter or fewer steps. Okay. So chapter 18. Um, I whipped together these slides as quickly as I could. You'll notice that we have some carryover from chapter 17 with our carbon nucleophiles. But well, really what we're going to start talking about are our oxygen nucleophiles and our nitrogen nucleophiles. Both of those are now weaker nucleophiles. This changes the dynamics of some of our reactions when we look at how they do the nucleophilic addition. Okay? And so we can take advantage of some of that reactivity differences. So before we even get into this, we need a real quick word association game. So feel free to shout out whatever word directly comes to your mind. Let's try and keep it rated G, but we'll see what happens. The 
shall they? No, like, oh, crap? 152, right? Lots of math. Equilibrium. We're not doing any of the math, so don't give me that look. <laughs> okay. But what we are encountering now is that virtually every step of the rest of the mechanisms in this chapter are in equilibrium. And you'll look at it and be, well, why would it go forward? Well, it goes forward because we're pushing it forward according to the A's rule. If I want to do the reverse reaction, what do I have to do? I push on the other end of it to push it out the other way. It's all equilibrium based. Every single one of the steps of your mechanisms are going to be like, why would it do this? Get out of the why would it do this. It's not why would it do this, it does it. Okay? Accept it and move on. Okay? So, first thing, water as a nucleophile. Okay? What would happen? So first off, is it strong or weak? It's a weak nucleophile. So let's ignore the reaction rate for the moment. What would happen? Nothing? Nothing happens? Oxygen should attack the carbon of our carbonyl. We don't have to worry about the alkene and that alpha beta unsaturated ketone because it's not an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. So it attacks the carbon of our carbonyl, breaks the bond. What do we end up with? And your first response will be, well, why would it want to do that? You're right. Why would it want to do that? It doesn't do this well. We'll talk about how we can fix that as that last question. All right. Now what happens? You break the bond with the hydrogen, and then the okay. oxygen why did you start breaking the bond with the hydrogen? Because oxygen doesn't want to be positive. Oxygen doesn't want to be positive. Well, why don't you bake the bond with the carbon? Because it's a stronger bond. We just made that bond. That's a perfectly valid bond to break. What does that mean? Equilibrium. Okay. The other option is we break the bond with the hydrogen. The result... Oh, I actually missed an arrow. Oh, well. What, what picked up that hydrogen? Anything remotely basic in solution, say a carbonyl, say water. I don't care. Something basic picked up that hydrogen. Not strongly basic, something remotely basic. Am I at my final product now? No. Why not? They're still charged. So what has to happen? Hydrogen. We need hydrogen. Well, is there a hydrogen floating around in solution that, say, just was picked up by something remotely basic? Yeah. So now we have something remotely acidic floating around out there. And we end up with our final product. with our two OHs. What was added across the double bond? Two alcohols were added across the double bond? Hydrogen and an OH. So we added water to the structure. When you are really, really thirsty and you add water to yourself, you are becoming hydrated. hydrated. What do we call this compound? A hydrate. Right? It's just referencing that we've added now water to it. This mechanism is horrible. You're absolutely right. You don't like that. Okay? Mechanistically, it's fine. All the arrows are good, but we would say this reaction is horrible. This is never going to occur. The primary reason you would say it would never occur is right there in that very first step. We generate a negative charge and a positive charge in the very exact same structure. Not particularly likely. More than likely, if we looked at that equilibrium, it's going to greatly favor the reactants. The only way I can then get it over to our products is by somehow changing the reaction. Can I improve the reaction rate? Okay, I could add a lot of heat. Okay, that could speed it up. What else could I do? 
I could add an acid. What would adding an acid do? What would the acid react with? The oxygen of the carbonyl carbon. So instead of starting with a carbonyl, I'm starting with, that's a positive charge. That's not looking any better. Hey, I had an acid catalyst. I can now speed this reaction up. Cool. What else could I do? I could add a base. By adding a base, what am I actually doing? What would our base be? Give me a good base. Sodium hydroxide. What does adding a base do? Speeds up the reaction by making the nucleophile more nucleophilic. How do we speed up the reaction by adding an acid? We made the electrophile more electrophilic. So by changing those structures around, by adding different catalysts, or even changing the carbonyl we're starting with. Okay, nobody suggested that. Formaldehyde, this reaction goes really fast. Why? Those hydrogens don't stabilize the carbonyl carbon very much. So this reaction is incredibly fast, and it does favor the hydrate form. But if I go through and put on CH3s, Well, those CH3s stabilize that carbonyl carbon. I get very small amounts of the hydrate. That slide you've already seen. We talked about that when we first started talking about nucleophilic addition. Okay. I am done, but I just want to point out a couple other things. Oh, I did stepwise through that. That was nice of me. Speed it up by using a stronger nucleophile. Adjust your reaction. Make sure you have a stronger nucleophile. Predict your mechanism. Don't look at the slide, though. Speed it up. Make your electrophile more electrophilic. We just talked about the two ways that you could approach both of those. D attempt those mechanisms. All we'll do is look at the mechanisms next week, next week and then we'll move on.